And then one last thing about, I think, you know, in terms of system design and BRICS, I still hear a lot of the discussions about what kind of common currency we need um, or what needs to be the back of this currency. Is it going to be oil? Is it going to be gold or some special commodities? I think there are a lot of misconceptions in terms of what really that sort of currency is, right? It is not going to be a common currency that replace the national currency. Please don't do that, right? The Euro lesson is should be well learned, um, but we could have a common clearing unit for countries to clear up their trade and clean their clear up their um, investment exchanges and so on and so forth. And that does not need to be backed by anything, right? This is a fiat money we're talking about. This is a unit account. This is an accounting unit that we're talking about. So I think there's a lot of misconception about that. And I think that needs to be debunked. And finally, I think, you know, what the BRICS has been doing really well, um, the NDB, so, um, the New Development Bank, yes, has been talking about is we wanted to increase the local currency borrowing, right, to 30%. Um, and I think that is really the right, you know, step. That's a, that's a step to the right direction. Okay, thank you very much for that overview. And maybe we lose, use the last 50 minutes we have to talk about another uh, subject that, that you're uh, um, working very much on, which is the connection between mm -hmm. MMT and developing economies or like how, how let's say also global south countries. I like that expression much better because like for a lot of countries, calling them developing doesn't make that much sense anymore. Like if you think of Malaysia or Indonesia, which like have sectors that are that are that are booming and fantastic, they just work a bit differently uh, from from West uh, uh, Western countries. But um, if we what what does your research at the moment suggest of how smart um, smart strategies should be designed economically in order to also support um, uh, global south global south <clears throat> countries to really live up to their full potential. Right. So what I would address is that from an MMT's perspective, I think really a genuine and, and progressive development strategies would work on three different levels. So for one is at the national level. I think the government needs to understand their policy choices. For example, if you want to fix exchange rates, if you want to borrow in foreign currencies, that could put yourself in a, a very vulnerable position. So what you want to do is try to mobilize your domestic resources as much as you can. So one of the examples that I often you know, want to tell, even if it's you know, for countries that are in the BRI project, for example, Kenya, right, that borrow you know, Chinese money to invest in their uh, railways. And yet at the same time, they're talking about you know, 60% of the materials are localized. So the question is, if you are able to use your domestic currency, mobilize your domestic resources, then why do you need to borrow external, externally, right? And you're borrowing in the dollar, which you don't have control over with. So to me, I think it's very important for um, you know, global South countries to understand that they need to mobilize their own resources. They need to really strategically invest in their energies, in their food, in the technological sector, in the human capital, right? I hate that word, but you know, but it's common for people to refer to that. So it's really need to be, uh, you know, really understand that development finance should come primarily from within. Um, I actually have a paper that it's exactly about that. Um, so that is at the domestic level. At the regional level, I think it's very important for global South countries to build that cooperation and consolidation and and solidarity and and, and collaboration. Um, because again, developing South is actually really resources rich, right? When you think about the G7 countries, which, you know, again, many of them are like, you know, I, I, I would say Japan, for example, right? Where you are, um, they are very resources uh, scarce, right? So as a matter of fact, the developing South countries are very rich in their resources. The difficulty of course is, you know, um, some countries have certain resources, others don't, right? Um, so I think it's very important for the, the regional economies to work together, right? They build those development banks, they have trade system, they have investment system that would really help them to leverage on their respective strengths and help out each other. And I think that is very important. So by regional, I don't mean just the geographic, right? It could be countries like BRICS, right? That they're energy rich, um, they have a lot of complementarities in their trade, um, they could work together to advance their common interest. 
And then at the international level, um, I strongly advocate for a reform of the international financial architecture, right? These post Bretton Wood system, the IMF, the World Bank, um, I think they are really out of place, right? They, 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 they were old, they were 80 years old, um, they, were served, they were serving the, 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 the Western countries' interests. Um, they are being in, very incapable, right? And I think pr purposefully so, um, not to finance climate change and not to finance development and, and not to provide really strong international financial safety net. So I think that system needs to be revamped. So I think that would be, you know, I think it's a very ambitious uh, policy or, or a proposal, right? But I do think that all these need to happen um, for us to really to talk about, you know, sustainable development and cope with all these other ch challenges that the global south faces. And parts of, <clears throat> excuse me, parts of that are happening actually, and uh, now with the the movement around the BRICS, right? Which is does will not replace IMF and World Bank, but it will create. <laughs> it is working on creating an alternative, but that still doesn't alleviate us from the responsibility to design or to understand what are smart local, as in national policies for development and what are dumb ways of doing national development. So uh, question, why is it that a lot of countries, when they, when they get foreign, um, um, when they, when they um, have development projects with like, uh, Western countries, the US, Japan, um, or even like also with, with China. China does a lot of, of um, uh, infrastructure projects, right? Why is it that a lot of these national Global South countries um, then borrow money in the foreign currency, as you just said, borrow yuan or borrow USD, and then get indebted in that foreign currency, which again is the original sin under MMT. This is what what you cannot get your head out of if you if you if you run out of that currency in your in your in your um, balance sheets, right? Instead of, I mean, the other way to do it would be to issue bonds in your local currency, get local currency, use as much of it as you can in your economy. And the part where you need to import, like, let's say some high tech stuff from Japan, a couple of trains or from, from China, import those trains and you need to pay new on, you just use the, the, the good old FX exchange and you just exchange your currency instead of borrowing. And why is that not the mechanism that is used? Why is it the borrowing that's used? Yeah, I think this is a great question. I would say there are two major reasons. One is there are just constraints, right? The original sin is, is one of them. So you mentioned something like, can we just do currency exchanges, right? The difficulty again is um, some of the countries simply can get a reasonable uh, rate or simply no country, right? Wanted to accept, um, you know, certain currencies, right? So when you have hyperinflation, you know, let's say you're in Zimbabwe or if you are in Argentina, right, you have the peso, it would be very difficult for you to buy, to, to have the buyers of your currency and get that foreign exchanges. So I think there is a real constraint in some ways for developing countries. Um, but that said, I also think that there are a lot of misunderstanding. The, the idea that, oh, if I borrow foreign currency, it's going to be cheaper, right? Because I'm paying lower interest rates. But they're not really thinking about, you know, if you're paying interest rate in your own currency, you can literally pay whatever interest rate that you need to pay, right? There's no limit for you to issue your currency. There's no payability issue in this case, right? Um, the constraint, of course, is inflation. But you're not going to run out of your own currency. This is what I'm saying, right? Um, but a lot of developing countries are thinking about, oh, if I borrow foreign cu currency, it's going to be cheaper. The interest rate is going to be lower. So it's less costly for me. So I would rather do that. Which I think again, this is this is very unfortunate, right? That they shouldn't be doing this. There are much bigger costs um, that is hidden than just the interest cost that you are seeing, right, on your book. Um, but going back to the previous constraints, um, there are times that countries would have to borrow in order to, like what you just mentioned, some of the essential technology that they that they don't have, or some of the essential materials that they, that they can't buy at home. So maybe they would need to borrow a little bit in those foreign currencies in order to import those things. Um, but again, I think by having this regional collaboration, but also be very strategic about how much you want to borrow. And when you borrow, also make sure that you really um, have good balance sheets management, avoid very large persistent currency mismatch and duration mismatch. So there are ways you can both economize the need to borrowing borrow, but also manage that borrowing in a more sustainable way. 
Um, so that's one of the reasons I think all this idea of debt sustainability assessment that is, you know, uh, engineered by the, the IMF needs to be revamped. Countries need to think about what currency they borrow in. They need to think about what they do with their debt, right? If China goes in and, and land and you build these um, power generation projects, you build these railways or you build these infrastructure that is going to really help you to strengthen the economy and produce cash outflow, uh, inflows in the future. I think those debt should not weigh the same way as you are using your debt, uh, use your borrowing, using your foreign currency to buy, you know, luxury goods, right, from, from outside of the country. So I think that needs to really be thought through, right, by the policymakers, um, what to borrow, how to borrow, how to use your foreign currencies. I think that is very important. And then one last thing about, I think, you know, in terms of system design and BRICS, I still hear a lot of the discussions about what kind of common currency we need um, or what needs to be the back of this currency. Is it going to be oil? Is it going to be gold or some special commodities? I think there are a lot of misconceptions in terms of what really that sort of currency is, right? It is not going to be a common currency that replace the national currency. Please don't do that, right? The Euro lesson is should be well learned, um, but we could have a common clearing unit for countries to clear up their trade and clean their clear up their um, investment exchanges and so on and so forth. And that does not need to be backed by anything, right? This is a fiat money we're talking about. This is a unit account. This is an accounting unit that we're talking about. So I think there's a lot of misconception about that. And I think that needs to be debunked. And finally, I think, you know, what the BRICS has been doing really well, um, the NDB, so, um, the New Development Bank, yes, has been talking about is we wanted to increase the local currency borrowing, right, to 30%. Um, and I think that is really the right, you know, step. That's a, that's a step to the right direction. Um, that That's what needs to happen. Yes. I'm very interested in this one because how how would it work? Um, we've had this moment in the in the, the creation of the euro when the euro was just a unit of account, but not yet physical um, fiat money. It was just used on the exchange. Um, is what you're thinking about with a common clearing unit? a form of that and how how would it work if we have a unit that you can just count debt in across um different economies but then the individual the individual economies would still run on their own currencies because there yes. would be all of these fluctuations and also the changes in the exchange rate to the common uh, to the common unit right so in what sense would this be an improvement rather than a complication well this current uh, unit, it's really just to clear your trade balance and your investment balance. Um, and that happens between different central banks. Mm. So it's not going to be integrated into your domestic economy. Mm. And there's no exchange rate sort of conversions um, at the clearing unit uh, uh, system. So for example, if I am uh, a you know, buying from you or you, you are selling to me and we do this exchanges, at the end of the day, we're using everything, right, to, to use this common unit to denominate our trade. And so, yes, there, there will be sort of, you know, your currency is going to work different with the ratio of this currency and my would, would be different. But when we are clearing between us, we're using this common currency and not really connected with, with our domestic currency. So, that way, um, you may be able to earn more of this common currency and I may earn less. And so, you know, our exchange rate would be different, but it doesn't in any ways affect our own economy, right? All we're exchanging is this common unit. And what is more important, I think, uh, than just using this common currency to denominate and clear the debt between us or the credit and debt between us is the fact that, you know, really looking at Keynes' idea of this international clearing unit, ICU, um, I think the more fundamental question here is that how do we set a system that prevent the country from accumulating this ICU, right? I think that is more of the problem. Why? Because in the current system, we have countries that really wanted to always run net surplus. Yes. So they're able to get the currency and build up the reserves and, and so on and so forth, right? And so that could create a better than beggar, a better than neighbor effect. And that could create a deflationary demand deficiency for everyone. So really the question here is whatever currency that we use, 
we wanted to make sure that countries don't intentionally try to accumulate that common currency and profit from, you know, the neighbors' demand. And so that is really the key because I think the, the, the biggest difficulty right now in BRICS is that you have China, for example, that is a big exporter, net exporter, right? And so that's why you, when people were saying, you know, the yuan is going to rise. Well, but then if China is running surplus and countries can't get the yuan, then how are going to clear that that can be done? So I think really what the system needs, it's not some technicality, you know, sort of, it's not the technical issues. It's not about currency fluctuations or not. It's not about, you know, what currency we exactly use for clearing purposes, but rather how do we build a system that does not encourage one country to accumulate, right, the the, the units and derail the, the entire system. It's funny because that, that's the same problem that we discussed before. If you're a net exporter, you will end up with more cash and even the ICU will lead to the same, will lead to the same fundamental conclusion. So what you need is a fiscal transfer <laughs> mechanism, which right. I don't think any country would 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 want to do because the idea is if I have a lot of that that ICU, then that's my wealth, then I can I can buy from abroad and they have to do as I say, as it has to do as I say. I mean it's just beneficial to me, right? It's just right, nice right. to be on that side right. of the ledger. You you yes, absolutely right. If you start already accumulate that, you know, currency, then fiscal integration, fiscal transfer become inevitable. So there need to be clauses, there need to be measures that prevent this from happening in the first place. So what Keynes has proposed, for example, is to say that for countries that accumulate these uh, units, they need to be, they will be punished. If they don't spend, if they don't use their units to import from other countries, um, then this units could be appropriated or you have to pay a heavy interest or whatever. Uh -huh. Yeah, but on, here we have a problem because like, appropriated by who? If this is a dis distributed system without a central authority with with so uh, sovereign rights, then who's going to do that? Right. Well, that's a great question. So that's why countries have to agree on that. Yeah. Right. This is yeah. not exactly as a fiscal transfer per se, but sort of like we will give you a certain amount of time for you to use your clearing units. Right. You need to use it to import from other countries, whatever that might be. Are or there, you have to invest. Yeah. Are there any ideas for creating something that a couple of, I think, Austrian or so economists had in the in the past, which is to build in a mechanism to make sure that the clearing unit over time loses in value, which would increase the the the, the incentive to actually spend it again, right? Is absolutely yes. You can be as creative as you can, right? We need to be more creative. But the point is, you know, that is the key. That how do we create a system? where there's no incentives um, to hoard. accumulate the units, right, to hoard the units, right? You have to make the units somehow only use as a clearing purposes, not accumulation pr uh, 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 purpose. And so um, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's just, we need to really think about these kinds of questions rather than how do we set up this payment system? Is it gonna be digital? Is it gonna be, you know, what kind of messaging system we need? And, and I don't think those are the most important points. The most important points is, what country should come agree should come to agreement with, and how do we design this clearing unit uh, without setting it up to fail? And I think that <clears throat> kind of discussion, um, I think, is still relatively uh, insufficient at this point. No, I, I agree. The fundamental problems are still theoretical, not practical, and the theory hasn't changed for thousands of years. The one thing, the only thing that we've been agreeing on for like three thousand or more years is the three purposes of money: uh, unit of account, store of value, and medium of exchange. And what you're saying is we need to separate them at least a little bit in order to make a make a working system. And we haven't succeeded at that. I mean, nobody, <laughs> even in 2024, <laughs> it's quite fascinating that we still grapple with the same problems right absolutely and, absolutely which is why i'm very happy to be connected to you now um yan Liang. um when if people want to follow you where can they do that um i do occasionally post on um x or otherwise mm. no twitter previously um also on linkedin um so yeah that that's where i post a lot of my social media exposures and um sometimes i would also post some of my academic uh, publications or talks and things like that. So I think that would be the best place to to find my work. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you so um, much for having me today.
Everybody, please find uh, Professor Yan Liang on uh, X Twitter, and uh, I'll be in touch. We will talk again because this is highly fascinating and relevant, also for the for the future of BRICS and 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 the international monetary system. Thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, I look forward to it. Yeah, see you next time. Thank you.